everybody. Welcome to a live tutorial with uh, Mr. In Stitches and I. Today we're going to cover the second part of how to read a crochet pattern. So uh, hopefully if you've all had a chance to pop over to our website and pick up the Moss Stitch Dishcloth pattern. So it's a free pattern over on the Pattern Workshop page of our website, uh, jadainstitches.com if you've never been there before. And you can either download it or print it off and you can follow along with us today as we go through this entire pattern uh, pretty much section by section, and then we're gonna make the actual dishcloth together. So this should give you an idea, hopefully, of how patterns are typically put together, what some of the, um, the little strange things that you might see in the pattern instructional part mean, like stars or asterisks and brackets or parentheses. And also we're just sort of why notes appear and how you should pay attention to them. So uh, I've got my hot coffee, so does Mr. and Stitches. We're gonna jump right into it here with the pattern. So I've got the pattern. And first of all, we're gonna look through all of the different sections together. So this pattern has a material section up front, a stitch legend, a notes section, and then the actual instructions of the pattern. So the materials tell you exactly what you need to complete the pattern as written. So for example, this says cotton, yarn, four ply, worsted weight, approximately 30 grams. It's a very small little moss stitch pattern. It's kind of like a, the, the dishcloth is meant to be useful, but also a helpful way to learn the stitch pattern. So you don't need a lot of yarn. So I've got some cotton, four ply, medium worsted, size four yarn here. Um, it's just the typical stuff I have. It's the Burnett Handy Crafter. So if you're wondering what one I'm using, that's it. And uh, I've got a big pile of it. I've been pulling out of the inside of this thing. <laughs> the next thing we need is our crochet hook. This one, this says 4.5 millimeter or a five millimeter. So the 4.5 millimeter is often also known as a G6. That's also sometimes a 4.25 millimeter. So G6 in the US and I think also known as a four in the UK. Or you can use a five millimeter. I have a five millimeter here today. This is also known as an H in the US. Um, and I think, I'm not quite sure what it's called in the UK, but it's somewhere between a four and a five. Uh, a four, a size four or a size five in the UK. So I'm using a five millimeter hook. Now there is no specific gauge for this kind of pattern. So you'll notice that there is no gauge note mentioned in the pattern anywhere, which means that um, as long as you feel that your stitches aren't too tight or too loose, you're fine. It doesn't matter how big your dishcloth comes out. Uh, obviously, uh, we've provided a couple of different of uh, hook sizes because we figure that's what works best with the particular yarn we suggested. Um, but when you're making something like a dishcloth or you're practicing a stitch, you really just want to use a hook that complements the yarn you've chosen. So in this case, five millimeter hook and a size four medium yarn. Little sip of my coffee. Also, this needle and scissors. So you're gonna want a yarn needle. Um, I've got my trusty yarn needle here with the big guy and a pair of scissors. And that's pretty much all you need to get started. So that's all that's in the material section. Now the stitch legend is helpful if you're new to reading patterns. Um, any of the short forms that typically show up in the body of the instructions like SC, you see that a lot in my patterns. SC means single crochet, R means row, uh, ST or with an S in brackets, that may mean stitch or stitches. You may see ST on its own or you may see STS, in which case ST is stitch or STS is stitches. Same thing with chains and slip stitch. SL, ST is short for slip stitch. So that's the sort of the some of the short forms that show up in the instructional part of the pattern. It's good to familiarize yourself with a stitch legend on a pattern, just so you have a good idea of what all of those stitches mean or what the short forms mean. Because most patterns typically use the same short forms, but not all. And again, this depends largely on the sort of the, the history behind the author of the pattern, what country they're writing from, what language they're writing from, and what they learned uh, when they were coming up through the entire system. So uh, always check out the stitch legend and don't necessarily assume that what you see in the body of the stitch of the pattern is what you think it was uh, because sometimes it changes up. Now, sometimes you'll see that a pattern is written in either UK terminology 
or US terminology. I don't have that written down here anywhere uh, because I sort of take for granted that I'm using the US terminology since I'm uh, broadcasting from the West. Uh, but if you are, if you picked up a pattern and you're not entirely sure, like if it's come from a UK blog or a UK site, you might want to just double check to make sure that it's not UK stitch, um, stitch terminology versus US stitch terminology. Lots of the UK um, uh, folks use the US terminology or both. It's, it's helpful to know them both. And if you do run into patterns where you've got UK terminology and you're a little unsure, we have a UK terminology versus uh, a US sort of a conversion chart also on our website. It's on the tools page. And if you um, want to click, right click on that actual chart and print it or download it, that's a handy thing to have on hand as well. Uh, just in case you're bouncing between English written patterns, which may be UK or US terminology. Oh, that's a good cup of coffee. Okay, so that's the stitch legend. Now into the notes section. The notes section is often something that, um, it's it's little ideas that you should keep in the back of your head, uh, comments about the pattern at large, or even something to do with the, the stitch pattern itself. So for example, uh, the first note we have here is the number of stitches you should have at the end of each row will appear in parentheses. Parentheses are the brackets. So at the end of every single row, Hopefully you can see this. And if you're following along, you should be able to. At the end of row one in the pattern, you'll see the number 20 in brackets. Same thing at the end of row two and the ends of row three through 20. So that is the number of stitches you should have at the end of the row. And in order to make sure that your pattern is working properly, if there's a stitch count mentioned, it's good to always check your stitch count at the end of every row or every round, and that'll keep you on track. This also has a comment about the moss stitch, the pattern itself. So it says you can begin the moss stitch directly into your foundation row if you're comfortable identifying your chains. Otherwise work row one the way it is written. So in the case of the pattern here, row one is a row of single crochet. So it's an establishing row of single crochet. It just basically makes it easier for you to see the, the stitches that you are going to use and or skip. And it's helpful sometimes for beginners to have a foundation row of single crochets or a found, pattern foundation row of single crochet. It's a little easier sometimes to see than just a bunch of chains and sometimes your foundation chain row can switch on you or twist and turn. So that's why we went with a row of single crochets. And the last note is this pattern is based on an even stitch count. So if you wish to make your dishcloth larger or smaller or heck even make a blanket out of it, you can change your foundation chains accordingly, even at numbers plus one for turning. So. This pattern, in other words, can be worked over any even number of stitches, but if you're beginning with a foundation chain row, you want to work an even number plus one chain for turning, and that's if you're going to use this pattern the way it is written. So that's the notes. The pattern is the actual instructional part of the moss stitch dishcloth rather than read it through first, which I generally encourage you to do when you've got yourself a new pattern. We're just going to work through it together. So I'm gonna have one more sip of my coffee and then I'm gonna grab my yarn and we're gonna get started. And I just kind of wanna warn everybody that we're experiencing some very windy, turbulent weather here in Southern Ontario today. So if for some reason our broadcast cuts out, we will restart it, but you might have to go back to our channel homepage to find it. So with any luck, our internet will stay, uh, and, our, and our hydro will sort of stay on, <laughs> but it's very, very windy here. So just so we know. Okay, I'm gonna put the pattern just to the side here so you can see what I'm doing with my yarn and my hook. I've grabbed my yarn. We're gonna begin with a slip knot. So anytime you're going to, you're told to chain a foundation chain row, you always start with a slip knot. And the pattern, the first thing the pattern says is chain 21. Now it says CH21. I know that CH based on the stitch legend means chain. So I'm told to chain 21 and that's exactly what I'm going to do. So we're going to chain 21 to start. All right, there's 21. Make sure you have 21 stitches. So if you don't count along in your head or you easily get distracted, take a moment to go back and count to make sure you have 21 stitches. And then the pattern 
says row one, single crochet, SC. And according to our stitch legend, SC means single crochet. Single crochet in the first stitch, ST is short for stitch. And then there's an asterisk or a star, and it says chain one, skip one stitch, single crochet in the next stitch, asterisk or star. Repeat from star to star, ending the row with a single crochet in the second last stitch and a single crochet in the last stitch. You should have 20 stitches, chain one, turn. So that's the whole of row, um, I'm sorry, I was reading row two. <laughs> we wanna <laughs> read row one. I'm getting jumping ahead of myself here. Row one is single crochet in the second chain from the hook and in each stitch across. So like I said, if you're comfortable just jumping right into the stitch pattern, you can skip row one. Otherwise you can do what I'm gonna do here, which is to work a row of single crochet. So to single crochet in the second chain from the hook, you skip the first chain, you find the second one, and you single crochet into it. And it says single crochet in the second chain from the hook and in each chain across, and you should have 20 stitches. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna single crochet in every single chain all the way across. Now this video that we're doing here is part two. So we went through a lot of the sort of conceptual information about how to read a pattern in a live stream we did last Monday. So if you missed that one, uh, there's a lot more information in it that you might find helpful, especially if you're new to reading patterns. So we encourage you to give that one a listen while you're sitting working on something um, because there's hopefully some information in there that will help prepare you for how to read patterns going forward. And uh, this is part two. We figured we would literally go through a pattern together, make the little project, and hopefully have, give everybody a better idea of how patterns are generally put together. I already have a bit of a knot here. There we go. All right, so that is the end of row one. I have 20 stitches. Hopefully you can see that there. 20 single crochet at the end of row one. And the end of row one also says chain one, turn. So before we finish, we chain one and we turn. So now we're all ready to work row two. Now row two <laughs> is the actual stitch pattern. This is what I sort of jumped ahead to originally. It says single crochet in the first stitch. Then the asterisk, chain one, skip one stitch, single crochet in the next stitch and asterisk. Okay, so before we do anything more, we're going to single crochet in the first stitch and it helps to read the sentence out loud to yourself. And generally instructions have little sort of commas next to them. So if you see like a line of instructions, single crochet in the first stitch comma, just stop right there. Don't burden your brain with whatever comes next. Just do the first thing you're told to do. So in this case, it's single crochet in the first stitch. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna single crochet in the first stitch. Then it says chain one comma, all right? Chain one. Then it says skip one stitch comma. So there's the next stitch. We're gonna skip it right there. So it's the next one, we're gonna skip that. And then it says single crochet in the next stitch. So we've single crocheted in the first stitch to start. We chained one, we're skipping a stitch, and now we're jumping ahead to the stitch after that. So we're gonna single crochet into it. All right, so, so far that's everything wrote in row two up to the second asterisk. The rest of row two says repeat from star to star, ending with, okay, so we just wanna repeat from star to star until we get to the, the last two, single crochet stitches in the row. So we're gonna ignore the last part of the sentence first. We wanna just keep repeating what's in between the two asterisks. So the information between the two stars is chain one, skip one stitch, single crochet in the next stitch. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna chain one, skip one, single crochet in the next stitch. Chain one, skip one, single crochet in the next stitch. Chain one, skip one, single crochet in the next stitch. And you're gonna keep doing this until you've gotten all the way across to the last two stitches because that sentence, that row two, says repeat from star to star, ending the row with a single crochet in the second last stitch and a single crochet in the last stitch. So I know that I can just keep repeating what's in between the two asterisks until I get up to the second last stitch. So that's what I'm gonna do.
All right. I have single crocheted in the this next stitch, chained one, I would skip a stitch, and that brings me up to my two last stitches. So the third last stitch is one I skip, and I know from reading ahead in the second row that I need to single crochet in the last two stitches. So that's what I'm gonna do. That's the end of row two. Now in this case, chains count as actual stitches, and so you would count your chains and your single crochets all the way across. You would still have 20 stitches. Um, if you were just going to count your single crochets, it wouldn't be 20. So you wanna count across the top of all the stitches. It's easier to see your stitches when you're looking across the top because they all kind of look the same. So you should still have 20. More importantly, you should have something that looks somewhat squarish so your ends are nice and aligned. And the end of row two says, chain one, turn. So we chain one and turn. Now it doesn't say this in the pattern, but I am going to pause and have a sip of my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Step three, pause. <laughs> sip coffee. Sip coffee. Change foot position. Shift. Stroke and resume. <laughs> All right, so three through 20. So this is something you will need to row 20. So that means 17 rows, row three through row 20 is whatever comes Just next. So I hope I can't see what I'm Just doing. Just <laughs> a little further back, it's clear. I think it's clear. Okay, so for rows three to row 20, all we have to do is repeat row two. So you're just going to keep repeating everything that you're instructed to do in row two, and you're gonna do that 17 more times. So row three is a repeat of row two. Row four is a repeat of row two. Row five is a repeat of row two. And the reason for this is the moss stitch is the same little thing worked in every single row. Not all stitch patterns obviously are like that. Sometimes it takes several rows for a pattern to, to repeat. But in this case, it's a nice simple little stitch and every single row is just like row two. So the moss stitch, once you get sort of into the swing of it is, it's delightful. You can kind of turn your brain off and then you just sort of end up with this really cute little stitch pattern that comes together pretty quickly. So row two, again, instructed us to first single crochet in the first stitch. So we're gonna do that. Single crochet in the first stitch. <laughs> ding, ding. I've activated the bell. <laughs> Means it's time for me to take a sip of my coffee. It's time for you to take a sip of your coffee. And I have a super chat here from Krista. Oh, thank you, Krista. <clears throat> And Krista says, hello from Grafton, West Virginia. Grafton, West Virginia. I'm going to say West Virginia, WV. WV, yes. My Sorry. daughters, Rachel, 13, mm -hmm. Abby, 11, and Mercury, 6 oh, months, you. love watching your videos. Aww. Thank you. Oh, that's so sweet. Aww, Thank you so that's much. That's so sweet. Oh, I love the name Mercury. That's so cool. <laughs> Okay, where were we? Right, the first single crochet of row two is a single, or I should say the first instruction of row two is to single crochet in the first stitch. So we've done that. Then we move into the section of the row that's in the asterisks, and we know from having just done it that we need to re do everything that's in between the two stars and then keep repeating it. So that's chain one, skip one, single crochet in the next stitch. And in this case, you're actually gonna be single crocheting into the chain space because that's what's there. Now you could you could put your single crochet in the actual chain stitch, but it's just easier to work in the actual space. Chain one, skip one, single crochet into the next stitch. And in this case, it's easier to use the chain one space. So we're gonna do that. Chain one, skip one, put that single crochet into the next chain one space. And it's pretty easy to see. You can almost feel your way across Remember that after you single crochet, you chain one. Don't forget the chain ones because that will mess up your stitch count by the time you get to the end of the pattern. So always single crochet and then chain one. Skip one. Now we're doing the same thing. When we get to the very end of the row, we're looking at two single crochet. So if I were to single crochet in the last space and then chain one and skip one, that brings me up to the last two stitches. And I know that I want to single crochet into both of them. One of them is a chain one space and the other one is an actual single crochet. <laughs> Janelle says, um, 
her four-year-old calls these videos yarn movies. Yarn movies. <laughs> that's very intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what That's exactly is. what they are. They're yarn movies. <laughs> I don't know if the plot is terribly gripping, but <laughs> it's definitely there aren't enough twists. Or are there? <laughs> there's enough twists. Thank there's you. A, there's yeah. a lot. There's enough twists. Yeah. All right. At the end of row two, the last thing we're told to do is chain one turn. And that's what we're going to do. Chain one and turn. And it's the same thing for row four. We're going to repeat row two. Row two begins with a single crochet in the first stitch. And then everything in the stars. So we chain one, we skip one. The next thing is going to be a chain one space. Single crochet into it, chain one, skip one. The next thing is the single is the chain one space. And you just keep repeating this all the way across. And this is the beauty of the moss stitch pattern. It's really, really simple. You can just continue to repeat row two until you get to 20 rows. Or if you wanted to make it a little longer, you could just keep repeating row two <laughs> until it was as long as you wanted it to be. So Summer asked her two-year-old, who's this? <laughs> and her, her two-year-old yells, Jada. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. <laughs> it's a Jada yarn movie. It's a Jada yarn movie. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> All right, at the end of row four, it's still 20 stitches because row two tells us that at the end of the row, we should have 20 stitches. So at the end of row four, we still have 20 stitches and we chain one and turn. Now, how do you count your rows? The moss stitch actually is pretty great for that. So there's our foundation row, our foundation pattern row of single crochets and all those little single crochets are all in a line. Then the next row, you can see single crochets, but there's spaces between them. And then you can sort of see that the single crochets of the row after that sit in between the single crochets of the row before. So they kind of go up in a little diagonal. So it makes it easy to count your rows. There's row one, row two, row three, row four. So that's how you can count your rows in the moss stitch pattern. And now you can just keep repeating row two until you get all the way to the end of row 20. And then we can go ahead and put a little border on. So since we're gonna be repeating row two for a while, if anybody has questions about reading patterns or anything to do with this pattern in particular, please feel free to go ahead and ask. And Mr. and Stitches will do his best to grab what, what he can and relay it to me here. And while he's doing that, I'm also gonna have a sip of my coffee. Enjoy it while it's hot mm -hmm. or lukewarm, lukewarm at whatever this it is now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, because of the nature of this stitch, it tends to want to kind of like pull in on you because of all this, the chains and single crochets. So go feel free to give it a tug when you get to the end of every row and that helps keep it nice and sort of square. Gee, I drank my coffee before you rang the bell. <laughs> we have a super jet from Nikki. Hi, Nikki. Thank you so much. I gotta pull some more of my yarn out here. I also really like the moss stitch for a dishcloth while we're sort of waiting for some questions to roll in here because it has those little spaces that the chain ones create. And I find that that kind of helps create more suds. So if you're scrubbing away on a, a plate or something, you get a little bit more sudsy action from this particular stitch than maybe some of the other ones that we've done. So I'm very fun. And I just frankly love <laughs> this stitch pattern. It's quick and it's fun. Um, here's a question from Jackie. It's sem semi-related. Okay. Um, if you turned this into a baby blanket, mm -hmm. could you suggest a lacy edging? Um, yes, this is because this is basically all single crochet, just about any kind of edging you'd want to add to it would look nice. It's also a very plain stitch. Um, I don't know a lot of 
stitch patterns by name that would make good lacy edgings. Um, so many of them have so many different names. <laughs> I wouldn't really know what to call them, but I do like the idea of um, a little tiny scallop. That's really sweet. It also doesn't have a lot of holes. Um, so that's a nice edging for a baby blanket. Um, we have a pattern, actually, we, we put a miniature scallop uh, pattern on our C to C baby blanket, corner to corner baby blanket tutorial we did. So if you want to see what a little miniature scallop looks like, um, we did a mini scallop border in that tutorial. So that would be really cute. Um, and also I would recommend the falling leaf stitch. We just did a dishcloth actually in that stitch on Tuesday. And I used the falling leaf stitch to also do the border and it creates a really sweet little pattern all the way around. It's not um, it's not really big, but it's also doesn't have a lot of holes in it. So there's no sort of like big spaces for little fingers to kind of end up getting stuck in. Um, and that's a nice way to finish off this kind of a pattern as well. So anything, any, really any stitch pattern you'd want to use, I would recommend starting with the, the base of single crochet, which we will actually do in this particular pattern before you work any, um, additional patterns around it, unless you wanted to do the miniature scallop. You could probably work that across the raw edge and that would look just fine. Um, what would you say is the average size of a dishcloth? Well, um, I've had dishcloths of every single size. So usually I feel a dishcloth is anywhere between six and eight square inches. Sometimes they're larger and that's nice. And sometimes they're smaller because they're kind of built more for being scrubby. Um, but a dishcloth should be something that you can grab with your hand and you can, you know, stuff it into a mug. So you don't want it to be the size of a tea towel. I think you'd want it to be big enough that it's a good, um, it's, you can stuff it into a glass or a tea towel. Um, you can sort of fold it maybe into quarters to like, you know, wipe down the sink or something, but it should, it shouldn't be. I'd say anything, eight, eight inches, but anywhere between six and eight inches square, it makes a great size for a dishcloth, in my humble opinion. And as somebody who does a lot of dishwashing, then <laughs> I'm going to say those are my favorite mm -hmm. size dishcloths. Um, a couple of people have asked, um, will, um, will you also be teaching how to read charts? Yes, down the road. I don't do draw up a lot of charts yet. Um, so as soon as I have drawn up some uh, for our use, then we'll definitely go through how to read those. Uh, charts are really neat too, because they don't necessarily involve um, a lot of language requirements. <laughs> oh, is that time for me to take my we We have a couple, break? we have a couple of super chats that came in. Oh, how nice. Um, the first one here is from Shelly. Hi Shelly, thank you. And the next one that came through was from Angela. Hi Angela, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you guys, really appreciate it. And I am gonna have a sip of my coffee. Mr. and Stitches is right, it's starting to cool down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how many rows have I? Let's see here. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I've completed nine rows in total so far. So I've got 11 more to go. And like I said, you don't necessarily have to use the specific hook size that is suggested in this pattern. It depends on the yarn you're using and there is no gauge for this pattern. So you wanna make sure that your stitches aren't too tight. If they feel too tight, you wanna use a larger hook and you don't want your stitches to be too loose. If they feel too loose, you wanna use a smaller hook. Um, and that's just a good rule of thumb to follow for any pattern if there's no gauge. I like how this pattern tends to look like it's got a bunch of little, um, little, little flying V's or flying geese because the actual single crochet stitches really stand out and you can sort of appreciate them. <laughs> uh, 
A few people have asked if you can use it as a face cloth or a washcloth. Uh, of course, it all depends on the material you use, yeah, I, I'd say. Exactly. Um, this stitch is beautiful for both. Um, but obviously, what you put against your face, you want to be nice and soft and not necessarily really scratchy because you can use this stitch and use a scrubbier dish brick, like um, like the scrub it yarns that are out there that have a little bit more grit to them. Um, you can use that and this pattern and make a great dishcloth, but you might not want to stick that up against your um, so the cotton, the handicrafter cotton that I'm using, or um, and absolutely, this makes a great washcloth um, because it suds up really nicely. Mm -hmm. So that's something you might want to keep in mind. Um, I I do like to use these in the shower. So, and if you use like a slightly bumpy little pattern like this one is, um, they, there can be kind of a I'm not going to say a real exfoliating factor to it, but it can certainly kind of um, have a little bit more of a scrubby action than maybe just a plain single crochet stitch. We talked a little bit about the different things that show up in a pattern um, in our last live stream. So we were talking more about kind of how a pattern is constructed and the concept behind how most of them are written. Obviously, there's some variance from author to author. Uh, but generally, we talked about sort of all the different sections you're likely to find in a pattern. And there's something else I wanted to mention that we didn't get around to mentioning last time. Is that if you've purchased a magazine or a book, um, and that's where your sort of the that's where the pattern is that you're going to be using. If there's instructional information or short forms or something in your pattern that you don't recognize, and you don't immediately have a legend or something right there on the same page as the materials and all that other information for your pattern, check the beginning or the end of the magazine or the book. Because sometimes a lot of the magazine, like if a if a book puts together a whole bunch of patterns. They may have a lot of similarities or they're all written by the same author. So there might be a foreword in the book or maybe a list of terms um, and commonly used phrases that are explained a bit better in the back of the book. And that's how a lot of crochet and knitting books are constructed. So if you're a little unsure about the pattern, look through the front of the book, look through the back of the book, or like anything, read the whole book, read the whole preface, the whole introduction, and maybe skip to the end and just see if there's any extra information back there that you might find helpful um, because that can be where they put a lot of information that pertains to the pattern because they don't want to keep repeating themselves every time they, they write up a new pattern for the book. The same thing can go uh, with a magazine. A lot of magazines have basic um, information or stitch information, description, stuff like that included in the beginning or the end, typically in the end. Uh, and that's a good place to look if you're trying to figure out something to do with your pattern that just doesn't seem to be making sense. <laughs> we have a new member hey. that joined us. Uh, welcome, Daphne. Hi, Daphne. Welcome to the family. Daphne makes me think of daffodils, and I'm seeing daffodils everywhere right now, and that makes me so happy. And <laughs> we have a super chat from Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much. And Michelle says, thank you with a big smiley face. Aww. <laughs> thank you guys for spending some time with us today. It's uh, Victoria Day here in Canada. So we all have the day off. Um, it's a long weekend that we're enjoying, although I wish the weather was a little more uh, conducive to festivities. It's kind of like we said earlier, it's really windy and kind of chilly out there. So it's the perfect day to stay in and do a little crochet. This is a quick stitch pattern. It's probably because every other stitch is a chain, which I feel makes it sort of zip along a lot faster than some other stitch patterns do. And uh, I just, this is really coming together nicely. That's looking real nice. I like it. Yeah. I, just, I just love this pattern. Um, would it hold soap suds very well? Yes. I would say yes. Yes, the, the little extra spaces that are in between that are created by the chains somehow help make it easier to suds up so you get better sudsing action with this particular stitch pattern. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> we have a Australian super chat. Oh, hey. <laughs> from Oz. From Oz. Oz Lioness. Oh, wow. Cool I don't day. know if I can do this. Good day from Australia. Actually, it's more like good eye, I think. Good eye. Good eye from Australia. Good eye? I don't know. We're probably butchering it. I'm so sorry, Oz. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oz Lioness says, Good day from Australia. Just call me Ozzy. Ozzy. You have helped me so much. Uh, time difference sucks, though. Oh, I hear you. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, it's a big one. It's, <laughs> it's, a it's big, literally the biggest. <laughs> it's the biggest time difference. Yeah. It's the 21st of May today, on Tuesday, 2.30 a.m. in the morning. Oh, my gosh. Oz, you're... shouldn't you be snoozing in bed? Wow. You're a crochet warrior. Wow. <laughs> Oz is a crochet warrior. Wow, thank you so much for staying up with us. And a super chat to boot. What's what's the future like? I'm wondering. It's uh, is is Tuesday nice? Because <laughs> yeah, what's it like in the future? <laughs> I think that is so cool. <laughs> Oz Ozzy's in the future already. That's awesome. Which means that it's still there. So if Ozzy's speaking to us from the future, then that means that Tuesday's still coming. <laughs> Tuesday's still coming. Oh my goodness, two thirty a.m. Woo. Now I'm really zipping along here. I should probably pause and count my rows. What am I at? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Oh my gosh, I'm already on the second last row of the dish club. <laughs> Shell has a question mm -hmm. in relation to one of our last uh, posts. Sure. Um, did Mama and Stitches decide what to make with her new cotton yarn? I don't think so. I it, don't think she has fully decided yet. And I bet you any money it's still all piled up in the chair um, that she took the picture on. She likes to sit and stare at her yarn kind of like I do. <laughs> uh, but it was we'll, all cotton. so um, All cotton. And we'll, we'll uh, you know what? When she starts making something, we'll post, we'll post yeah. Uh, the update. Yeah, that's a, yeah, we'll do that. I like it when Mama's probably going to make a blanket or a shawl. That's typically what she likes to do. Looking good. All right. I have completed 20 rows, and it's really small, but that's okay. We're going to put a couple of, of rows of border on it. So I'm just going to grab my little measuring tape. So far, it's an adorable five and a quarter inches by about almost five inches long. So it's it's a little wider than it is tall, but that's okay. Like I said, I like my dishcloths to be anywhere between six and eight inches, but sometimes I like them just a little bit smaller, especially if I'm trying to get them into something like a mug. Um, you can, because of what's in the notes section on this pattern, you can make it any size you want as long as you start, or as long as you work the moss stitch over an, an, an even number of stitches. So if you're beginning with a foundation chain, then make it an even number and add one more chain for turning on the end. So you can make it into a blanket, you can make it into a towel, you can make it into just about anything you want. I just, I really love this stitch. All right, so now we're at the border. So there's two rows of border mentioned here. Um, you can make the border bigger and bigger and bigger because all we're basically doing is single crocheting around and around and around. So the beginning row for the border row, um, it tells us how to, where to start, and how to keep kind of going around and around. So for example, this says chain one and working down the first raw edge, single crochet into the end of each row. So we're not chaining one and turning. We are going to chain one, but we're just going to work down the raw edge. So when it says raw edge, that's basically the unfinished edge. It's the edge of all the rows. And we're gonna work down here first. Now we know there's 20 rows in this little dishcloth so far. So technically we should be able to work 20 single crochet into the edge of this dishcloth. And I love working a basic row of single crochet on most patterns, especially if I'm putting on a pretty little border, if it's gonna be anything, a baby blanket, a bigger blanket, a dishcloth. I like working a row of single crochet around the whole thing first, regardless of what I do next, because I feel like that creates a nice solid base on which to add the pattern, or it also helps kind of even up the edges. And if you're going to change colors, it's good to work your border row, your first row of single crochet with the same color that you used to make your whole piece with. This also kind of disappears into the edges and it makes the rest of your border look really smooth and tidy. So there's 20 rows. We're going to try to grab the edge of 20 of each of those 20 rows. So you're just going to grab the edge of the stitch. 
the stitch will look a little different. Sometimes it'll be a single crochet. Sometimes it'll be like a, a little, um, it should be always be the edge of a single crochet, but it might not always look the same because you're turning and going backwards with every row. Work the first few stitches, pause, and make sure it doesn't look like it's too crowded. Um, you don't want to, we've got one, two, three, four rows here. You don't want to crowd your stitches because that will kind of make your edges look a little uh, ripply or wobbly. And just pull back and pause every so often to make sure it looks nice and tidy and even. And try to make sure that you get 20 of them. not always easy to see where you're going to put an actual stitch. So sometimes if you have to pause and just sort of find a good place to put it, go right ahead and do that. I have 15 so far, I wanna work another five and that'll be, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, that looks like it's gonna work out. All right, the fifth one or the last one, I should say, my 20th single crochet is actually gonna be in the bottom of the foundation chain row that started it. So I'm gonna work my last, so that's the 20th stitch right there. So that's 20 single crochet running down the first edge of my little dishcloth. But that number 20 is actually part of the corner. And it says here in the border row, so chain one, we did that, working down the first raw edge, this side, single crochet into the end of each row, we've done that. When you get to the bottom corner, so the corner stitch or the bottom chain, single crochet, chain two, single crochet. So in brackets, it says single crochet, chain two, single crochet, because everything happening inside that bracket then has directions behind it. So in brackets, single crochet, chain two, single crochet, end bracket. Right immediately following that, it says in the corner stitch. So that means I know that everything inside that bracket gets worked into the corner stitch. So I've already worked one single crochet. I'm going to chain two and single crochet into the same place. So that's single crochet, chain two, single crochet, everything that was in between those two brackets, all worked into that little corner. So into the corner stitch and that's the bottom. Then it says single crochet across the bottom of the foundation row. Well, that's all of these little chains, the underside of the chains from the foundation row. They're pretty easy to see. You wanna work a single crochet into each one of them. And including the little corner stitches, you should have 20 stitches running across the bottom of your little dishcloth. So the tops and the bottoms are obviously a lot easier to single crochet across. The um, You have to sort of use your noggin and feel your way along when you're working up the, the uh, two unfinished edges. Um, so that's why it's helpful to sort of be able to count your rows, see where all your rows are, and know that if you have to single crochet into the edge of each one of them, then you can at least make sure that if you have 20 rows, you get 20 single crochet running down the edge, whether they're evenly situated or not. Um, it's gonna work out nicely and we're using the same color of yarn, so they're not going to show. All right, we're getting to the last chain. So this is the corner stitch and the um, border row one directions says, so work single crochet across the bottom of the foundation row. Did that. Single crochet, chain two, single crochet, that's in brackets, in the next corner. All right, so that's the next corner. We're going to single crochet, chain two, and single crochet all into that same foundation chain because that's the corner. And now we've worked one side and the bottom. So we've got two corners made, two sides done. Then it says, 
work a single crochet in the end of each row up the other raw edge. So basically exactly what we did down the first edge, we're gonna repeat up the other edge. You've got 20 rows here. You've already worked a single crochet into that bottom corner. That counts as one. We need to add 19 more. And I'm just gonna work across. So very neatly, I'm gonna count as I go, making sure that I've worked 20 in total all the way up the edge. All right, the 20th stitch is going to be in the top of what was the first single crochet of row 20 of my actual pattern. So I've worked, I've got 19 single crochet, including the corner one here, running up the side. Number 20 is gonna be right in the top of that first stitch of row 20 of the actual pattern. But because we've reached the top and it's a corner, this says single crochet, chain two, single crochet, all in brackets, into the next corner. So that's what we're gonna do here. Single crochet, chain two, and single crochet. And then it says single crochet across the top of row 20. This was row 20, and we're gonna single crochet right across the top of it. So that's easy. You can work the single crochets into the chain spaces and into the actual single crochets. But you'll still have 20. That includes the corner stitches. When you get to the end, it says, work a single crochet across each stitch of the top of row 20 and end with a single crochet, chain two in the last stitch and single slip stitch into the first single crochet of this row. So the first single crochet was down here, down the edge of the first side. So when we get to the very end, we're gonna single crochet, chain two, and then slip stitch to join in the top of that first single crochet we made. So we've completed four corners, and now we have a neat and tidy little single crochet border that runs all the way around the outside of our moss stitch dishcloth. So you can give it a little tug, flatten it out, and you should have something that looks relatively square. Now this pattern goes on for row two of the border. We're gonna single crochet all the way around again, but if you wanted to be fancy, here's where you could bust out your fun trim patterns and you could start working different borders around the edge of this little dishcloth, or if this was a baby blanket or a bigger blanket, you could start working different border stitches around your blanket. And it would be so much easier now because we've created an establishing single crochet row all the way around. So we know that the stitch count is nice and even. We know that there's the same number of stitches on both on all sort of four sides. And this is going to allow you to, you know, create a stitch pattern if you want based on the number of stitches. And they're all evenly spaced. So your border will look nice. You could also change colors at this point and it wouldn't matter so much because you've evened off the edges of your, of what would be the raw edges of your dishcloth or your blanket by working single crochets across them in the same color. But we're gonna follow the uh, pattern. We're gonna do border row number two. I'm just finishing off my coffee. Border row number two begins with a chain one. So we're gonna chain one and it says single crochet in the same stitch as joining. So to single crochet in the same stitch as joining, 
you basically just single crochet into the same stitch that you slip stitched into in the previous row. So right, right on top of that first stitch uh, from the row previous. Then it says single crochet in each stitch down the first side. So that's easy enough. You're just gonna single crochet in the top of every single one of those stitches. Now, if you wanted to do something kind of a little more interesting, but not too exciting, <laughs> you could work different kinds of stitches, so different size stitches. So instead of using a single crochet here, you could use half double crochet, you could use double crochet, you could even use treble crochet if you wanted something that was like a little lacy, but you know, not too difficult to do. Um, and the same pattern would hold. So you'd work this, you'd work a stitch into each stitch all the way down the side. In the border row, it says single crochet, chain two, single crochet in the next chain two corner space. So the chain two corner space is the one we've created in the previous row. So you should be able to get just the tip of your finger into that. You're going to work, in this case, single crochet, chain two, single crochet into it. But if you were using the half double crochet stitch or the double crochet stitch, you would just do double crochet, chain two, double crochet into that. Or if you didn't feel that was a full enough corner, you could add a few more extra stitches into the corner space. So like two double crochet, chain two, two double crochet. As your stitches get taller, sometimes you need to add a few more in just to get it to turn nicely. So it's fun to experiment and I encourage you to do so if you want to. Now we've turned and we're working another single crochet in each stitch all the way along the bottom. And it's basically the same thing all the way around. You work a single crochet in every st stitch and you work single crochet, chain two, single crochet into those chain two corner spaces. The border row sort of takes it through, takes you through each side of the pattern. But if you read the entire, so if you read the whole row's worth of instructions, you'll see that it's taking you through each side of the square. But if you pull out and you consider what the pattern sort of instructions are telling you, you realize, oh, okay, I'm single crocheting in every stitch and I'm working single crochet, chain two, single crochet in every chain two corner. All right. And then it's, you know, it looks, sometimes it looks a little more confusing than it really is. It helps to say it all out loud and then consider it. What is this actually telling me to do? Oh yeah, it's telling me to just, you know, work a single crochet in every single crochet. <laughs> But the important thing uh, between, like a pattern should try to not leave much up to the imagination, just in case, you know, you're coming at it from, from the point of view of a beginner, or maybe you've never made dishcloths before. It, a good pattern doesn't, doesn't make assumptions about the person reading it. Um, and that's, so that's something that, you know, you might feel to yourself, well, that was an awfully, you know, wordy sentence, or gee, you know, you could have just summed it up by saying, a plus B equals C, but remember that if you've got any kind of experience reading patterns or doing projects, um, more and more stitch instruction is going to seem uh, easier to you because you've done it more, you kind of know what's coming, you, you kind of recognize the pattern in the speech or in the instructions, and that's just basically a sign of experience. So I'm rounding, I think that's my second corner I just did here. And uh, I'm working a single crochet in each stitch up. Is this across the top? No, oh, this is across the top or the bottom. This is across the other side. <laughs> there's a there's a few people that are watching us live at work, and they're sneaking they're <laughs> sneaking the live stream in. So I thought I'd share that with you. I love it. <laughs> Don't get caught. But hey, how is it any different than listening to the radio? I yeah. Say? <laughs> Just prop your phone up in the corner of your desk mm. or wherever you are. And uh, I, I love listening to, to a tutorial versus like, you know, talk radio or something. I feel it's just so zen. I just let it wash over me. I love it. 
All right, where am I here? Oh, I'm all the way back to the beginning already. Goodness gracious, that was quick. Okay, so the very last thing we need to do is work a single crochet, chain two, single crochet in the last chain two space. So that's what I'm gonna do. And then slip stitch into the top of the first single crochet of this row. So there's the first single crochet. There's the chain one, I'm skipping over that. I'm just gonna lay it down flat for a second. Give it a nice little stretch out. Oh, I just love this pattern. It is so darn cute. It looks so neat and tidy. It has a very, a very Victorian look to it, I feel. Um, so that's the entire pattern. Now, this also says, I'm just going to pick it up here. If you wish to make the border bigger, repeat border row number two as many times as you like. Yes, you can totally do that. Um, you can also substitute in half double crochets or double crochets, but keep in mind as the taller your stitch gets, you might want to add a few extra stitches in the corner. Uh, just something to keep in mind, but it, it is fun and it's kind of a neat way to experiment with different looks in a border. And then the last thing it says here is a hanger. So a nice dishcloth has a little hanger built into it. In my opinion, I like to be able to hang them up sometimes to dry from the corner. So where we are right now, we're going to chain 15 and slip stitch into the chain two corner space. And then this says sing, chain one, single crochet into each of the 15 chains and slip stitch back into the corner space. Fasten off and weave in ends. So we're making a nice thick hanger as opposed to just making a set of chains. So we're going to start from the corner where we are, chain 15 and slip stitch into the chain two corner space. So let's start with that. All right, there's my 15 chains. I'm now going to slip stitch into that corner chain two space. All right. And then it says chain one, single crochet into each of the 15 chains and slip stitch back into the corner space. Fasten off and weave an end. So now we're going to chain one and we're going to single crochet into each of those chains that we just made to make a nice solid little hanger. <laughs> Daniel says, I love yarn movies. <laughs> yeah, they're some of my favorite. I yeah, guess, right? yeah. All right, I've worked a single crochet in each of those 15 chains. Now I'm just going to slip stitch back into that same corner space that closes in the corner and makes a nice thick hanger. I like that. Then it says fasten off and weave in ends. So you snip your yarn, fasten off, make sure that's pulled nice and tight, and then you just weave your tail in. So I usually like to flip my, my little project over so that I'm looking at the back. And then I pick up the backs of a bunch of the stitches in the last row and with single crochet, it's nice and easy. These are already tightly placed <laughs> stitches. I have to share this with you. Okay. Quinnell says, I sometimes crochet a Jada pattern while listening to another Jada pattern. <laughs> Love Jada yarn movies. <laughs> Does that not get confusing? I think if I heard myself trying to tell me something and while I was trying to do something else, I think I'd get really confused. <laughs> I love it, that's so cute. <laughs> All right. So I've woven my tail in. I've got just a little tiny bit left over. So I'm just gonna trim what's left. And that is the entire dishcloth. So that's the whole pattern. From start to finish, we've read through all the different sections so we know what to expect. And this is the end product. I love it. Who doesn't like having Inception. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you've answered this before, but I'm sure. going to share it. It's from Oz. Since Oz, since Oz is able Ozzy? to stay up so late. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to read out uh, the question here. Sure. Um, if you do... If you 
do make a top or a cardigan, mm -hmm. etc. Is there an easy way to work out to make it how to make it smaller or larger? It depends completely on the pattern. So if every single pattern for a sweater was built the same way, I would say, yep, there's a formula to upsize or downsize. But unfortunately, no two articles of clothing are typically built alike. You can build a cardigan from sleeve edge all the way to sleeve edge. You can build front panels, back panels, sleeves all separately and put them together. You can do you know, the front and back panels all put together and, and then stitch the sides and add. So there's so many different ways to construct a garment, uh, depending on the stitch pattern that is being employed. And also if there's like color patterning, um, if there's little extras like pockets or things that they wanna um, leave uh, holes for. There are so many variables in a pattern that there is no one formula to upsize or downsize something. Um, so you have to have a really good understanding of, of the build of the pattern, the use of the stitch, and how the pattern is going together. If it's something like a piece of clothing that's built in pieces and put together, that's a little easier to upsize because for example, once you have like the back part of your cardigan built, um, or, or if it's just the back part that you're building first, you know your cardigan maybe has to be a certain width based on your own measurements. So you can maybe make a, allotments for changes in the pattern to fit those measurement changes. Um, but typically if you read a pattern, it'll tell you, you know, um, for this size, use this many chains, for that size, use this many chains, or however they're starting. And this is where using a gauge is so, 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 so important. Please, 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 everybody, if you see a gauge on a pattern, please take the time to do it. Take it from me. I have done so many patterns where I just jumped in head first, didn't bother with the gauge, and then and then was miserable and angry with my results. Um, and it's my own fault for not doing the gauge. Um, so definitely check the gauge. Always have your measuring tape handy to, to, to measure your gauge to make sure that it's correct. And that way you'll save yourself so much trouble going down in the future. And having said that, once you get better at it and you know sort of how a pattern upsizes, um, you might do the gauge and go, oh, good, I'm exactly one inch you know, bigger or I'm a couple centimeters taller. Um, that will upsize and that'll be exactly what I need in order to get the size of the cardigan or the sweater that I want. Um, so I'm using the right hook and I'm using the right yarn for me. Uh, but this is something that comes with a lot of practice and a lot of trial error and error um, over time. Uh, so yeah, that's why when we do wearables here on the Jane and Stitches show, we try to make sure that we've created something that can be based on measurements and easily sized based on measurements as opposed to stitch count because that can be so frustrating. Um, and it's much easier to upsize and downsize if you only have to concern yourself with the measurement of something and not stitch count. Um, and speaking of stitches, I just wanted to show you the final measurements of our little dishcloth here. This comes out to six and a quarter inches one way and six inches, oh, almost six and a quarter inches the other way. So pretty much a perfect square and pretty much the perfect little size for a little mini dishcloth. Um, I just, I love dishcloths this size. It turned out real nice. Yeah, it's it's a nice little yeah. square. Now you could make it bigger. Um, you could also make two and sew them together and have a dandy little hot pad uh, to put something on. This has got such a lovely bumpy texture that that's why it creates a lot of suds. Um, so if you're looking for something to be really, really sudsy in either the shower or in the kitchen sink, then that's another reason I like the moss stitch dishcloth pattern. Um, yeah, and of course you can use that pattern for a billion things. Uh, maybe we'll use it in an upcoming wearable. Um, we'll see, because this would actually make a very nice summery stitch pattern. It's it's just like it covers, so you won't have the sun kind of getting on you, but it it's airy enough that with the little spaces that it uh, would let the breeze through. So it I looks like it. great. I like it. I like yeah. it. Yeah. Like little last little dredge of my coffee here. Yeah. So hopefully um, our little mini series here, part one and two, help helped uh, help there. Yes. Part one, it was a live tutorial we did last week, if you missed it, because there is, um, like we said, more information about how to read patterns in it. Uh, we talked a lot more about um, concepts and where you might find information. And also uh, our website. So we've got tons of free patterns over on our website and they're all written more or less the same way. They're written the way we write them, but also a lot of them have tutorials. So if you're still battling with getting comfortable reading a pattern, because of course there's differences in all patterns, then uh, feel free to download all of our free patterns and dig up the free tutorials that go along with them and just sort of sit down and follow along with the, the, read the pattern first in its entirety and then read the pattern along with the tutorial. And hopefully that'll give you a much better idea of how to read a pattern, especially how instructions mm -hmm. are laid out and what they mean. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Shelly would like some more wearables. Yes, I, we are definitely trying to plan more wearables. It's just a, a matter of time. time and making sure that they can be easily upsized or downsized for everybody. I'm really, really, really passionate about being able to make clothing to fit your body or fit the bodies of the people you love. Uh, Mama and Stitches helped show me that door when I, um, I love to sew and I was always following patterns right to the letter and Mama and Stitches, uh, she sews differently. She, she sews haute couture and she made a big deal when I first met her about uh, showing me how to sew patterns and to figure out how to clothe yourself based on your measurements as opposed to following along with a pattern. Um, so I try to approach creating crochet wearable patterns the same way because Mama Stitches is um, she's a real inspiration. And I love that. I love the idea that we can wear things that flatter us um, and it, we don't have to pay it like we don't have to wait for someone to tell us how many chains to start with. Uh, so, yes, we do have more wearables coming. Um, hopefully, hopefully within the next couple of months, I'll see how how <laughs> I'll see how much time we have. Uh, but yeah, for sure. We I just I, I love making clothes. So I think I might want to go find some of that cotton yarn that mama bought. And oh, yeah. I liked the little ones. I like the little ones that looked like little pot like hockey pots. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna have to uh I'm gonna have to do a little yarn shopping. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I gotcha, I gotcha. Uh -huh. I'm going, I'm going. <laughs> dump, 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 squealing tires. All right. <laughs> That's it, everybody. I hope this was helpful. I hope uh, you certainly all enjoyed making a little dishcloth along with us on a Monday afternoon or very early Tuesday morning, wherever you may be. Thank you guys so much for spending some time with us and just basically hanging out, doing a little crochet, having a little chat, being helpful with each other in the community, and um, and just, just generally being crafty and awesome. Thank you guys so much. We will have um, possibly a little something for you tomorrow. Definitely our Friday video. And um, yeah, stay tuned for more fun. <laughs> All right. So we'll wrap it up mm -hmm. then. We're please, a little, yeah, we're a little over an hour. Please here. be sure to leave any questions um, about the pattern reading or possibly this tutorial in the comment section down below once this has become a video. Um, and we will try to get to everybody's comments and questions. We always do. And in the meantime, um, have you guys ourselves a wonderful week. Stay safe, stay crafty, and hopefully the weather gets better for everyone. Ding ding, really? <laughs> we've been uh, we've been stopped by a super been... chat. <laughs> I was like about a... to hit the end live stream button. It sounds like a song. Stopped by, <laughs> stopped by a super chat. <laughs> <laughs> the yarn movie is almost over. Yes, the yarn movie is over. Um, so <laughs> seriously though, we did get a super chat. This is from Hickory. Hickory Swim. Thank you. Bethany B. Oh, Bethany. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so Bethany <laughs> or Hickory says, I'm working my first tank top oh, nice. that is only a pattern. Oh, nice. Oh, cool. Well, I hope you did your gauge and I hope that um, your gauge matches because then you'll be sure of a really good fit. So, oh, also too, um, if you're using cotton yarn, um, always check your yarn labels. But if you're if you're making a wearable, always check your yarn labels to see if you can throw it in the washing machine or not. Cotton might shrink a wee bit, but don't worry, you can block it back out to its proper size. <laughs> so don't worry about that. Um, acrylic shouldn't really shrink unless you um, don't wash it in hot water and don't put it in the hot dryer. Um, but otherwise you could end up with melted um, fibers. <laughs> and But wool will shrink. So be sure if you're using wool that um, you hand wash it, I recommend in cool water and then you lay it flat to dry uh, because that way it won't shrink and you'll avoid a lot of felting too. So just uh, in case. <laughs> um, okay, so one suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, Air Bob, R Bob says a chunky sweater, please. A chunky sweater. Mm -hmm. And uh, one last question I'll before we down. go. This is from Kate. Mm -hmm. Kate says, what do you mean by measuring your gauge? So your gauge, let's say you were told, okay, work the pattern. I don't have a gauge on this particular pattern, but a gauge tells you to say, chain 21, work in stitch pattern as shown for 10 rows, let's say. So in this case, if you were told to work the stitch pattern for 10 rows, you'd chain 21, you'd work the stitch pattern, which is pretty much row two repeated, you'd work only 10 rows, and then it would say stitch uh, gauge should measure so many centimeters or inches by so many centimeters or inches. So in this case, if you were told, you know, finished product should measure six inches by six inches, 
then using the hook and yarn suggested in this pattern, that would be exactly what you get. Now, if you work the little stitch gauge and it says, you know, your stitch gauge or your gauge should measure six inches by three inches and you get it done and you measure it and you're like 16 by, you know, 20 or something, then you know that your gauge is way off. You've probably used too thick of a yarn and too big of a hook. So that means you've got to re-examine the yarn you're using, way go down with the hook size if you can, or completely change your yarn. And then you work the gauge all over again with the new hook and the new yarn and you re-measure and you make sure that you're closer, if not exact on the measurements. Same thing if you worked it out and it was way too small, that means your yarn is too thin and your hook is too small. So you need to upsize your yarn or upsize your hook or both. And it's very important, you might have to work a gauge if you're struggling to get the right you know, size or the right hook or the right yarn, you might have to work it several times and it can be very frustrating, which is why a lot of people are tempted to skip the gauge. Um, but if you're going to invest the time and the energy and the money and the materials into making something like a sweater, especially if you're making it for somebody to wear, then you wanna make sure that you are absolutely bang on with your gauge before you get going. Otherwise your sweater won't fit. It won't, it won't be the right size and you'll just be so upset and frustrated. You may not want to make a sweater again for a long time. That's what happened to me. So please, 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 um, if your pattern includes a gauge, just treat it like any other section of the pattern. Read the whole thing, say it out loud to yourself, and then do it as written and then measure it. It's often very handy to have a little measuring tape. So that's what it means by measure your gauge. And good question. Thanks for asking. All right. So we will wrap it up. Wrapping up. <clears throat> and we'll see everyone possibly tomorrow. Possibly tomorrow. Uh, but for sure on Friday. For sure on Friday. And I'm going to go wash the dishes with my new dishcloth. <laughs> <laughs> I'll play us out here. Play us out. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful night, a wonderful day, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.